Okay, so um, welcome everyone. We're going to be talking about aesthetic mastectomies and um, particularly in the setting of prophylactic uh, surgery in patients choosing not to have reconstruction. Uh, what are the implications of that? What are some of the alternatives? I, I'm Muriel Braxton. I'm a surgical oncologist in London, and I'm being joined uh, by Dr. Lynn Sill, uh, who's a surgical oncologist uh, and lead at um, Princess Margaret Hospital, and by Heidi Scott, uh, who's a um, uh, prosthetic um, uh, fitting specialist uh, that could speak to uh, some of the alternatives as well. So what we thought we would do is... Um, go over some of the uh, summary uh, information. I wanted to give you a little vignette uh, from a patient and then we can talk about um, uh, some of the other specific questions that people might have. And we're open to chatting about anything. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen here with you guys, if this works out. Uh, sorry, apologies. Okay, so I'm just going to play that again. My name is Steph. I had some options. I could choose to have implants. I could choose to do what I call puzzle piece, you know, take some of the back or some of the belly, move it all around. None of that was for me because I realized right away that I didn't want any extra chemical or uh, material put into my body. I didn't want to take a chance of any infection or something leaking or my body rejecting it, any of that. So that was right off the table. So then I thought about the uh, 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 puzzling and I thought, that's not for me either. I don't want to put extra stress on my body in any other place. And so I decided to start my own flat and sassy club. And uh, it's not really a club, but that's what I call it. And there you go. Um, so I, I, uh, I guess I don't need these, but they give you these and they're really cool because if you have a shorter dress that doesn't lay right, you can stuff them into your original bra. See, they're still attached. I haven't even used them. I was going to be a C, but I've never even used them. So there you go. But I have them if I need them. See, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take my straps down and show you my scars. And I'm just giving you that heads up in case uh, it might freak you out. But don't be freaked out because it's just me. It's just us girls. So these are my scars. I'll move up just a little bit. Now, I have a little teeny pudge here because I've been losing some weight. So we call this my baby boob. <laughs> and on either side, because with the weight loss, I've got a little bit of the puckering. But part of the process, which I haven't done yet, because I've been trying to lose some weight, is um, Dr. Braxton said she would trim that up. So that's not a problem either. Uh, let's see if I can talk her into taking some of this pudge. But again, that's a whole nother bottle of wine. So this is me. And first of all, fabulous work. I couldn't have been more pleased. I, I couldn't be happier with my choice. I couldn't be happier. Because really, I've got the best of both worlds. And even if I, if I want to do it, I could be an A. I could be an F, um, but I just like being flat and sassy. You can see from that, that uh, it's a really individual choice, I think is what that sort of highlights. What works for uh, one patient might not work for another. And I think the most important thing is to pick something that you feel comfortable with. I thought I would show a few incisions um, from various patients to highlight some of the challenges and some of the pros and cons. Um, and one of the things I often um, highlight for patients is the contour of your chest wall, which might feel straight when um, you're looking with breasts. So the breast kind of meets up with the belly and you're kind of at the same length, but really we're at, actually as women often quite pear shaped. Uh, and so you want to factor what your actual true chest wall shape is when you're thinking about this type of surgery. This is an example of a transverse incision in the patient. And this patient was very happy uh, but it does sort of highlight some of the extra soft tissue or some of the fat folds laterally that can be sort of more accentuated with this kind of approach. And it's sometimes hard to predict just how much that's going to show. This patient didn't want anything done. She likes to not wear a t-shirt. She's really happy to feel flat. She feels most comfortable this way. And this is how she looks in a t-shirt. 
Um, this is another patient who uh, wanted um, a risk reducing uh, contralateral um, mastectomy. She had one that she had to have. And so she wanted the other one off just uh, also to ease the um, uh, clothing and the choices afterwards and didn't want to have further surgery. I would highlight that some of this shows that some of the prominence of the chest wall. So in a very lean patient, you can see the ribs more prominently. It's a little bit more rimply in the bottom uh, part, but flat across the uh, front. And so it's easier for this patient to wear prosthesis if she wants to. Um, this patient has a little bit of lateral puckering if, if with an oblique incision, but it actually maybe lies a little bit flatter. Um, and then this patient um, wanted me to show how some of the other um, clothing techniques can be options to reconstruct. So she didn't want any further surgery. She's really happy with this sort of lace up um, uh, filled uh, bra that uh, works very well for her. And she was really happy. She didn't want to have further surgery because uh, she has other health issues as well. So some people um, choose it for different reasons. Um, I think that it's a very personal choice and um, it doesn't have to be a no never. I think that's one of the things to consider if you're choosing a you know, reconstruction, it could be a not right now or um, uh, we'll see as things go. Um, you often are candidates for delayed reconstruction. So choosing something and changing your mind down the road uh, is something you want to talk about with your surgeon to see if there are opportunities for that. And if you're not burning a bridge, is this the right fit for you right now? Recognizing that everybody's shape is different. Um, what matters to each woman uh, varies. And, and having an honest conversation with your surgeon about what um, your uh, chest wall uh, contour is, how they think the scars will lie, how they feel the folds will smooth out, um, will there be puckers, will there be additional surgeries, uh, and that type of thing that are required to end up with the result that you're happy with at the end. Uh, so that's sort of my summary. Um, Heidi, I wanted to uh, open it up for you to talk about some of the external prosthesis options. Thank you, Muriel. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you again, Sam, for this additional opportunity to um, participate in this session. Um, my name is Heidi Scott, and I am a, um, a fit specialist for uh, external breast prosthetics. And I work out of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, since COVID, however, I've been doing uh, personal mobile visits and uh, digital consultations. Uh, I'm here to talk about the world of external breast prosthetics and the options that women have um, who choose not to do an immediate reconstruction or who choose a flat option. Initially, um, you know, at the beginning of a breast cancer diagnosis, things happen very, very uh, rapidly and you have a lot of decisions to make at a time when uh, you're feeling sort of shocked and uh, overwhelmed. Uh, with your diagnosis and uh, things come at you very, very rapidly. And hopefully you have a healthcare team who is uh, able to guide you through that journey and provide for you information or resources uh, or pathways to get the information that you need to make the necessary decision. Uh, one of the most, one of the important things uh, I noted that Muriel said is, um, you can delay reconstruction, which sometimes for women who are trying to recover and regain their health, that's an important um, that's an important option to be given because for a lot of women, their health is the primary goal, um, and there are a lot of people that they have to consider in their journey, and that is the people who support them and the people who love them and their families. So uh, as, you, as you're going through this journey, there are a lot of considerations. So uh, getting the information you need to make a decision that is um, very unique to you, everybody's journey is different. It's important that you know all the options. Um, I'm here to talk about um, the evolution of, of uh, external breast prostheses. We can go on to the next slide, Muriel. Um, the, the breast prosthesis um, is about 45 years old. Um, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And in the case of the external silicone breast prosthesis, it is the case. A chemical uh, engineer uh, endeavored to find a solution for his mother post uh, breast uh, 
uh, surgery and mastectomy. And he founded Amona, the company that, uh, the very first company that manufactured external breast prostheses in the world. Um, the breast prostheses, the external breast prostheses has evolved over time. Um, the companies have listened very, very carefully to the women who have chosen to wear breast prostheses. And the industry has uh, stepped up to address a lot of the variety of problems uh, that women highlighted about um, external breast prostheses, uh, including weight. And now there is um, a multitude of options, including self-adhesive breast forms, very lightweight, uh, lightweight breast forms, and uh, breast forms that have pneumatic features that can customize themselves to the uniquenesses of everyone's uh, anatomy. So if your breast wall is very um, wavy or uneven, these are options that you can choose that will uh, customize the form to your shape. Um, the other thing that has um, been addressed um, in the world of external breast prostheses is partial forms. Um, women opt for lump lumpectomy or breast conserving surgeries. So now there are partial forms that can be used to um, regain symmetry. Um, asymmetry is a normal breast occurrence with or without breast surgery. So we see women who, who want to be perfectly balanced in any event. So um, that's sort of a nice addition to the world of external breast prostheses. Uh, the next slide uh, is an image of a full form option. So this is a woman who had a full uh, unilateral mastectomy and she decided to use an external breast prosthesis. And these three images give you um, an idea of what the external breast prosthesis looks like. It also shows an example of uh, the type of lingerie that is now available for women to uh, assist uh, wearing uh, the prosthesis comfortably. And as you can see, the lingerie is, is pretty alluring and it's very feminine. Uh, the next um, form is an example of a partial form. So this is an example of a client who had a um, partial uh, a lumpectomy or just some tissue removed and it gave her uh, asymmetry between her left and right breast. And um, using a, a partial form, the form that's used in this particular image is an adhesive form. So it sits uh, just under the bottom of her breast tissue and uh, helps fill out or improve the drape of her breast and helps fill out the uh, sagginess that you see demonstrated there in the bra fitting. Um, in the world of uh, mastectomy uh, retail, we have an area that we consider very, very important and it is recovery care. And through our recovery care, uh, the provision of recovery care garments, it offers women an opportunity to come see a fitter in advance of their surgery. Uh, it also gives you the ability to pick a, a, to select product that will give you immediate comfort in the early days following your surgery. Um, there are products that are, we refer to them as uh, post-surgery recovery care garments and they have features in them that will help you deal with things like dressing changes or drain tubes and things like that. You can wear them to bed. They're, they're suitable for sleeping because they lack hardware or uh, things that can um, apply pressure to your surgery site. So we encourage um, women to come see a fitter as early as they're willing uh, in their um, journey uh, immediately following diagnosis, if they're feeling up to it, is a good time because it does afford you the ability to get more information about what the future holds if you choose not to reconstruct. Um, the next slide is an example of the adapt ear. That's the breast form that I spoke to earlier uh, with the pneumatic back. And that particular uh, form has the ability to uh, become customized and contour to, this, to the chest wall. Um, and it, you know, so it, it becomes you, so to speak, in that it, you know, it really, it's like a customized prosthetic. Um, it's really important that you know all your options because it is your body, it is your choice. 
And, um, you know, lifestyle is very, very important. And most women want to focus on getting back um, to as normal as possible, as soon as possible. Um, this is a client who had a, uh, who's using a self-adhesive uh, breast form. And this slide here uh, is just giving you an example of some of the uh, leisure wear, the bras and the lingerie that's available uh, to supplement the use of external breast prostheses. Thank you. Oh, these, these are uh, some references and some resources that you can uh, turn to to get more information about external products. I'd like to add to that that there is another very good site if uh, you want to explore more or further uh, the flat option, and it's called uh, breastfree.org. And uh, that particular um, website has some, is a very, very good resource for women who want to examine more closely the option of uh, no reconstruction. Perfect. Thank you, Heidi. So I wanted to see, I'm not sure if there are any questions coming from the audience, but in the meantime, I'm, I, I welcome anyone who's uh, joined us to um, in the chat section, uh, post any questions that you might have. Um, to Lynn, maybe you could speak to uh, patients that are wondering about how they can uh, find out whether their breast surgeon, if they're choosing not to have reconstruction, is um, going to be focusing on the aesthetic aspects of the mastectomy and how, as a patient, do you navigate that? Yeah, I think that's a great question and, um, you know, one that comes up a lot. Uh, you know, we... Really, I think uh, when you're deciding about a treatment options from a surgical aspect, we do um, uh, offer a lot of, of options. Um, for most women, they have the ability to do breast conservation or mastectomy, and then if it's mastectomy, with or without reconstruction. So I think really having um, a good uh, open communication with your surgeon is key because if immediate reconstruction um, in the setting of mastectomy is not for you, then I think um, a discussion around what to expect about uh, what things will look like after surgery um, is is uh, is a really important thing to to have with the patient. So um, you know, asking those questions are important. Um, I tend to use a lot of uh, visual information in adjunct, and uh, you know, we there are lots of resources out there that can show photos of what um, you know what. Uh, uh, things would look like after a mastectomy, a simple mastectomy, for example. And I think also really keeping in mind, like you mentioned, um, what the expectations would be based on um, a, a patient's uh, individual characteristics. So their, their body habitus is really, really important for what, what you know, is, is going to be the end result in terms of their, um, their aesthetic outcome. So really kind of keeping that aspect in mind too and setting up the, uh, the, the um, uh, expectations is, is key. Right, yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would really agree with that. I think that it's okay to ask those questions about seeing uh, pictures, seeing results, um, almost like you would when you go for a cosmetic procedure, um, mm -hmm. it matters how things look. And so a realistic expectation of how you think it will end up uh, and photos with those particular surgeons is really helpful. I think um, we have patient volunteers that um, we will connect prospective patients to. And I think having a patient to patient uh, interface is also peer to peer, um, honest conversation about that type of thing. And additionally, I think that um, one of the things we think about when we think about reconstruction is a sort of a one procedure uh, type of thing. And most reconstructions aren't one single mm -hmm. procedure. They need little touch-ups too yeah. in an immediate reconstruction. And the same is sometimes true with mastectomy. Sometimes you need a little extra uh, liposuction to contour the lateral part of the abdominal wall to make it lie as flat as possible. You mm -hmm. might need a little nip or tuck like uh, my patient volunteer had talked about 
uh, and having those conversations about, you know, what you're willing to engage in, how important those little parts are. Sometimes they're not important and they don't bother you. And sometimes they do bother you. And then, uh, and then most surgeons are happy to do those things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to keep in mind that our bodies are always changing. And so, you know, like your patient pointed out is some weight gain or weight loss can really impact on how scars sit and how things shift and what, you know, where tissue might be more full in one area or, or not in another. And then we have to keep in mind treatment related changes, right? So some of our patients will need radiation to the chest wall after mastectomy. And that certainly changes, you know, the, the contour of the skin, the, the elasticity, um, you know, what the scar can appear uh, like. So all of those things are dynamic and, and evolving over, you know, a survivorship period. So all of those things are, you know, definitely things to discuss when, when you're talking about the full course of, of cancer therapy. Right. Um, there are a few questions, Heidi, in relation to um, what's covered and what's provided. Uh, one is specifically asking about hospitals and do hospitals provide aftercare products? So, so perhaps in one way, what's provided by the hospital immediately to the patient? Uh, and what are some of the costs of some of the uh, parts, some of the options that are not covered? Okay. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure what's available in the hospital, in all the individual hospitals, particularly I can speak to what is available provincially and from a private uh, benefit plan perspective. I can also speak to a program that we participate in called CAMI for Comfort. And CAMI for Comfort is a referral based program uh, that we offer complimentary to women prior to surgery. Uh, if they are referred by their uh, physician or, their, or a member of their physician's team, uh, they can come with the referral form uh, and uh, they can take advantage of a complimentary post-surgical garment. Uh, they can come in in advance of their surgery and uh, pick that up, be, be fitted and, and picked up it's a great opportunity to familiarize yourself too with uh, some of the garments that are available for later and to get precisely this type of information. The province of Ontario particularly, um, although other provinces have programs as well, I know uh, I originally hailed from the East Coast and uh, the Atlantic provinces also have programs similar to this, although they will vary from province to province. And also inside of that, there are other um, um, organizations like the Non-Insured Health Benefits Program uh, for Aboriginal communities that also offer all kinds of benefits in this particular area, but I'll speak to OHIP in particular or ADP, which is the assistive devices program here in Ontario. Uh, they have um, the breast prosthesis grant. So every woman uh, is entitled to participate in this uh, grant. It's an application process and it will provide for uh, funding for the purchase of a breast prosthesis. Um, it's not the entire cost, uh, breast prostheses range in price depending on, I mean, you know, what types of features you want to have. Um, but um, the ADP program generally covers uh, at least half in most cases, at least 50% of the cost of a breast prosthesis. In addition to that, if you happen to carry a private insurance plan, your insurance benefit, your insurance companies will cover uh, 80 to 100% of the remaining balance. Uh, of the cost. In other provinces where they don't have the ADP program, the insurance companies will cover 80 to 100% of the cost and you do not have to make an application to your province at all. Um, the bras are also covered under private insurance plans. Generally, the lowest benefit I've seen in my 30 years of um, offering these services is, is two uh, bras at reasonable and customary cost every single calendar year. Um, could, you, could you give an idea, Heidi, of um, like just a generic um, prosthetic bra, roughly how many dollars, um, and then the same with it sort of, I know they vary, but it's just sort of a generic um, silicone prosthesis. What okay. kind of price range are we talking about? So the price range that you would find with us is anywhere from $35 to 
80 to $90. That would be on the very high end. The average cost is 50 to $65. Keep in mind as well that these are non-taxable items. They're zero rated by the federal government. So there are no tax applied to any garment that you use that assists you to wear a prosthetic of any type is zero rated um, by the federal government. It's also deductible as a medical expense as are other items that you would choose, like uh, such as swimwear. Although swimwear is not covered uh, by most medical plans, it is an allowable uh, medical deduction under, your, under the income tax. And then a prosthesis, a silicone prosthesis? A silicone prosthesis can range in price anywhere from 250 to $550. Uh, partial forms, anywhere from 180 to $280. Okay, perfect. Um, Tulin, I'm presuming that your hospital is probably similar to mine with regards to patient assistance funds. Um, at, at least at our hospital, we have uh, an allowable amount uh, to cover all patient out of pocket expenses, regardless of income. Uh, and so that money, like many hospitals, is a fundraise. So it's not technically provided by the hospital, but it is used by the hospital, funded by the community to provide costs such as um, prostheses, wigs, transportation, um, babysitting during chemotherapy, all of the out-of-pocket expenses in an effort to make this uh, process easier on the patient. Uh, and so asking about those types of things are important. Most hospitals have volunteers who will sew the um, uh, pocket for the drain. Um, those the the um, prosthetic that my uh, patient had uh, shown the uh, knitted knocker. Uh, those are often uh, knitted by uh, patient volunteers also, and are typically provided uh, by the hospital. Smaller community hospitals may not have uh, those, and you can um, call around. Uh, but most of the time, if you ask, you'll find that there are coverage of those types of things. Um, in terms of uh, patients who have an immediate post-operative discrepancy in size during treatment, so perhaps not so much the mastectomy because in that case you would wear a uh, sort of a prosthesis, but um, one specific question um, Heidi is talking about post-breast conserving lumpectomy where there's you know, a cup size difference between the two and you know, what's sort of the best solution in the intermediate when you're not sure what you're going to do and you're sort of trying to ride that out through treatment? So um, there is the option of the silicone, the external silicone partial prosthetics, um, but alternatively, if, um, you know, somebody wanted to, you know, reduce the cost or didn't have a benefits plan or didn't feel that the ADP program afforded enough of a, a supplement to them, there are mastectomy bras that come with a uh, removable foam inserts. They're included in the construction of the, um, the bra. I did a digital fitting this afternoon actually with a client who had uh, a lumpectomy and radiation many years ago. And then later she did a reduction on her native breast to try and bring more symmetry. She opted for a reduction on her native breasts to try and uh, create uh, more symmetry in her breasts. But now that she's aging, things are changing and um, she has that deficit again. So we fit her with two very beautiful bras uh, that come with removable inserts. And what we found was when we took the insert out of the right side, which was her breast that she had reduced, and we doubled it up and inserted it to the pocket on the left side, it gave her really a perfect balance and great symmetry. And we didn't have to go down the road of a partial silicone form at all. And she was very happy with it because it was so much better than what she's been living with for several years. So finding a, a, a push-up bra essentially where the pocket has the insert, that might be an option where you take one, you fit to your larger bra breast and then you leave the insert in the other one, is that sort of the idea? Yeah, that, that's sort of the idea. I don't have as much experience with um, those types of bras without pockets, but the mastectomy 
bras are designed so that these, these little inserts and these wafers are stabilized inside the pockets. And the forms that come with, the inserts that come with the mastectomy bras that are of that uh, format, they're full wafers. They're not just little, um, so they don't move around and they encompass the entire breast so you get visually a, a, a rounder sort of um, appearance. And yeah, um, yeah but it is, it's, it's very solution. similar. The only thing is with top bras, sometimes you get a lot of gaping at the top of the, um, of the uh, cup of the bra. Um, and that's where the wafers that are designed for mastectomy bras are a little bit more advantageous because they will cover the top portion of the breast tissue as well. How does somebody find in any given city uh, wh where a prosthetic fitter might be? Most of the manufacturers have uh, dealer portals on their website. Like, so if you went into a Mona, for example, it would have a retailer portal where it would tell you, you just put in your postal code and it basically will identify who in your area is carrying that particular brand. If you wanted to find a retailer who offered a, a wide variety, you could go into all of the manufacturers sourcing them. Um, most of them have those, that information online. Okay, perfect. And then you can also call your local hospital, I think, or your breast clinic, because most of them will provide a list of um, prosthetic uh, vendors. I know we do. Some of them do. The issue that I've run into since practicing here in Ontario is that generally they're only updated annually. Ah. So that becomes the, the issue if they don't, they, they can uh, update them real time sort of thing. So if a retailer has a change or if somebody goes out of business or whatever, and the list can be quite long, but yes, they do. They do generally have a vend what they refer to as a vendor list or a provider list. Perfect. The Canadian Cancer Society actually also does that. They On their uh, website, you can go in and it will tell you there are vendors listed there who carry wigs or compression garments or prostate prostheses or bras. They're a good resource actually to find a vendor in your area. Mm -hmm. Um, to Lynn, can you speak to perhaps the pros and cons of reconstruction? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it, again, it, I think it's a very individual decision and it's not one size fits all for every patient. Um, we're really aim to personalize uh, cancer treatment if you're, if you're you know, talking about surgery for cancer, um, but also in terms of risk reduction, uh, what's important to the individual patient. Um, and so I think uh, you know, one thing is what options are available for reconstruction, because again, based on your body type and habitus, then um, there's going to be uh, perhaps some women who, you know, aren't good candidates for a flat base reconstruction. They, they, you know, they don't have enough tummy tissue to use for a DEP flap or, or a tram flap. Uh, and then you're thinking more about implant based reconstruction and what does that look like? Um, and then, so for some women, um, that's, you know, it's a very good option for others. Uh, you know, they may find, um, it uh, is not something they want to do at this time. And, and again, the decision you make now doesn't close the door to anything to be done in the future. I think um, when we talk about uh, those options at the time of cancer treatment, it can be overwhelming as well. Sometimes, you know, you're talking about everything you have to go through um, to deal with the tumor and, and uh, treat the disease um, to get you healthy again. Um, but then when you factor in, you know, the additional surgery and everything that's involved with the reconstruction, you know, that, that could be a lot to do at once, um, especially if you're looking at a path where you're going to need to have chemotherapy either before or after. And, and, you know, what does that all look like? So sometimes separating the two things can be, you know, a lot more straightforward for, for example, and then, and then just focusing on the treatment and then talk, talking about the reconstruction after. Um, what, one of the things I do uh, talk to patients about is, um, you know, we have experts that are excellent in terms of breast reconstruction, you know, plastic surgeons we work with are outstanding um, and they're very experienced and the reconstruction can really achieve 
aesthetic results now that uh, we probably never had, you know, year, years and years ago. So we, they were really doing an amazing job at immediate breast reconstruction and delayed breast reconstruction. Um, so I think that, you know, figuring out for each individual woman what the goals are at this point in time and, and what the, you know, what the future um, options are it is important to discuss. And sometimes that takes a few discussions, you know, it's definitely also something that you don't have to decide at the very first um, consultation, you know, you have to kind of sit and think about things and then, and then say, okay, well, this is the path I want to go down. So, I, you know, that's a lot of information right there. There's so many pros and cons. And again, I would just uh, emphasize it's not one size fits all. Every, every patient's so individual in terms of their decision making. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, one of the questions is around um, touch-ups, if those types of surgeries are covered by OHIP. Uh, and so every provincial um, payment plan is different, but in general, uh, no. In general, they're not covered by OHIP. Most uh, breast surgeons will do it, uh, will do these touch-up procedures, which basically means that it doesn't cost you anything, um, but your surgeon isn't paid. Uh, either. Um, and so they're happy to do that because that helps um, get you the final result that you want. So it doesn't cost you anything, but no, it's technically not paid. In other words, um, uh, the surgeon isn't paid. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that most surgeons who are doing this uh, are primarily motivated by the um, uh, patient and wanting to have a good outcome. And so that's part of uh, the whole care package. And it, and it's true for uh, reconstruction too. touch-ups are required. It's, it's, uh, um, I mean, it takes us years to grow breasts. And so it's not the kind of thing you can undo um, in a single operation. The skin has stretched out, the contour has changed. We've got some folds, we've gained some fat. Um, there are sorts of all different things um, to consider. Um, sort of a one related question um, is around some of the worries or fears or concerns about ending up with dog ears or things that you're not happy with and how do you prepare for that? Would, do you have any advice for that, Tulin? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's a matter of um, communication and good discussion and, uh, and just setting um, the expectations realistically because, uh, you know, every, every woman's body is different. And, um, you know, where tissue uh, ends up being maybe more accentuated or not is, is uh, sometimes um, a bit unexpected for, for patients, you know, so, so uh, women find that after a mastectomy and their, um, uh, you know, a simple mastectomy where it's flat, um, they do notice their abdomen uh, a bit more, you know, and, and so that's a very common comment we have, you know, and uh, so my abdomen seems a bit more protuberant, but it's not that your abdomen's changed, it's just that your perspective has changed and, and it does look different. Um, and similarly, you know, there's uh, fatty tissue that we all have in the underarm area. When you have a scar that goes across, I mean, that fatty tissue kind of can pucker, um, it can, it can look, it, you know, more prominent. It's not that it's, it's uh, different or that it's um, shifted. It has been there. It just looks different relative to, you know, the, than the, than the breast not being there. So, you know, these things, um, I think kind of, again, sh showing kind of what outcomes can look like visually, um, what, what to think about in terms of expectations, and then realizing it is a process. It's not, um, you know, a, a, a one, one time um, operation for a lot of women. Um, but then for some women, it's okay. You know, it, it, they, there could be areas where they say, well, you know, this, this is not ideal, but, uh, but I, it's not bothering me to the degree that I want to, you know, do another operation, have another operation. And for other women, you know, a few years down the road, they say, yep, yeah, well, this is, you know, something that's, I've, I've, I'm not dealing with very well, or I, I don't want to deal with at this point, let's try to address it. So it's, it's a, you know, a very evolving thing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think if, if you're really worried about um, how it's going to look, um, and, and, um, quite concerned about the, some of the aspects like the dog ears and, and um, hesitant about that part, then I think probably meeting some patients, uh, if you're able talking to your surgeon about having some connections to patient volunteers, seeing lots of pictures, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things will help you to see which parts might be an issue and asking them with my frame, am I 
Am I susceptible to have excess skin? Am I susceptible to dog ear? How much do you think that would stick out? What, what would it look like? Um, and how easy is a revision to fix that if, if that happens and I don't like it? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that way you can kind of expect um, whether it will be an issue for you, if it's a minor issue and you don't care, at least you know to expect it. Most of the time these are done with local freezing in the procedure room. So they're really minor um, touch-ups if we're gonna uh, call it that. I think that's probably the most realistic and so that you're not doing it until you really feel um, ready. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think, I think the other thing is um, talking to your surgeon about what their particular experience is and what their expertise is in and, and what their focus is on. I mean, uh, you know, we, um, Muriel, you and I do almost exclusively breast surgery as part of our elective practices. And so we have seen um, and we've done uh, these types of surgeries on all, all you know, types of women, different, different body types. And, and, you know, so we know, uh, different, um, uh, things to do to kind of minimize those, those changes perhaps and, and address them, um, which, which I think, uh, you know, comes with experience and training. And, and so just, again, having that discussion with your surgeon is, is important. Yeah. In terms of the volume yeah. of cases that they do, what their mm -hmm. experiences have been in those scenarios. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Uh, Heidi, can you speak to the prosthesis? There have been a few questions around um, the colors, are they matched to skin tone um, and those kind of aspects? There are um, different shades, of different skin tone shades of the prosthesis. Um, that's becoming more and more important now with the new adhesive types of forms that skin tones get matched. Prior to that, uh, prostheses were worn inside the pockets of the bras, so it wasn't as significant an issue for women, but it is a, is a growing concern, and now they are more and more becoming available in different skin tones. I wanted to speak to uh, one cute uh, thing that Tolan mentioned there is about the prominence of abdomens, and um, I find that uh, such an interesting area when I fit women with bras in general. And uh, when, you, when you put women in proper bras and all of a sudden their clothing starts falling from the, the space it's supposed to fall in, their waists become diminished. And a lot of times that's relative to, um, you know, you know the, the size of the forms you're wearing or the, or the breast size that you choose to reconstruct with. But a good quality bra that lifts and supports will often diminish the circumference of your middle or by parent. Mm -hmm. I also find that um, sometimes initially women tend to kind of um, hide their scars. So they curve their shoulders in and they're maybe in part healing and in part feeling um, that it's noticeable. And in doing that, you're kind of rounding out and you kind of make yourself almost more concave, um, which makes your belly feel like it sticks out more. So I'm often reminding patients to stick out your scar, put your shoulder back, have a flat frame you know, because it's going to let things lie as flat as possible too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question about how many revisions. I find in general, people will have one um, because usually when things heal, especially if one side is radiated and one side is not, it's really hard to predict how elastic the skin is going to be, how much pucker there is going to be. And so like Tulin mentioned, we try really to make things as flat as possible. If there's a pucker or a dog ear, or like my patient showing a little extra boob in the middle and a little pucker on the sides, I would do those three spots in one and then trim them out and we'd be done. Uh, so generally speaking with um, uh, aesthetically flat mastectomy, it's usually one uh, procedure. If you have an immediate reconstruction implant based and, and there's a little bit of a hollow at the top of the takeoff of the breast where the implant is, uh, you might need some fat grafting there to fill the hollow. Those might take a few procedures um, to uh, end up getting it uh, where you want it to get it. I just, just to touch on that, Muriel, I just sent actually a, um, a little link to a paper. One of our previous breast fellows, uh, Amanda Roberts, who's, who's a breast surgeon uh, up at Sunnybrook now, did a study on that looking at outcomes and, and how many reoperations patients did have when they had uh, a, a breast reconstruction. 
uh, post mastectomy. Um, and so, you know, the numbers are, I mean, I think that the, the title is once is rarely enough in terms of the, yeah. the surgeries, um, but about 35% of women had um, one additional surgery and about 26% actually had two additional surgeries um, in, in the follow-up period that they looked at, um, which, which I, I think was somewhere in about five to eight years. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not just a one operation and that's it. Even in situations where we aim to do an immediate breast reconstruction with direct to implant, you know, this is sort of something that we were trying to do more and more is to, you know, not go through the tissue expander phase and, and put in a direct implant with use of alloderm and all of these amazing techniques we have now, there still is need for revision after um, in, in, a, in a, a good percentage of patients. Yeah. I think that's fair, but I think it empowers the woman to decide how much um, she wants to change, that the options are available, that you can tweak these things if they bother you, and you don't have to if they don't bother you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you, at least something you get to choose, you have some control over how much you want to have treatment, or maybe you want to have uh, a little pucker revision five years down the road, or, you know, something not necessarily right away either. Um, I wonder, Heidi, if you could speak to social pressures for reconstruction. Do you see that in patients who come for uh, prostheses? There's a question around um, uh, patients who may, perhaps are choosing not to have reconstruction. Are, is there a subconscious or an overt uh, social pressure uh, towards patients uh, choosing for reconstruction against mastectomy or vice versa? I don't, I don't experience any women who've articulated to me that they have any social pressure in general. Um, you know, they, there is, I think personally, women are pressured to have breasts. You know, there is that sort of, you know, psychology. But I think uh, one of the best takeaways really is some of Tulin's comments around, uh, this is not a decision that needs to be made immediately. There is an option to delay this decision. And uh, having that conversation with your surgeon is really, really important to understand, uh, you know, if delaying reconstruction is a viable option for you, it gives women the opportunity to experience what it is to live without breasts or try another option, to see how um, their support and the people who surround them are gonna react. Um, most women who are apprehensive uh, in the beginning and they're like, you know, they leave the option of reconstruction open to them. Um, you know, I see them I see my, my clients repeatedly over the course of many, many years, and uh, some have opted down the road later to do reconstruction. Some have opted to do reconstruction that has failed. Um, and some who have thought they would do reconstruction and surprisingly find that they d didn't are quite content with their choice. Um, this, I can't really speak specifically to the social pressure. Um, you know, I, I don't feel like women should have any apprehension whatsoever about doing what they feel is in the best interest of their health and comfort. At the end of the day, that's the objective that I try to achieve uh, when I um, forge a relationship with my clients. I, I try to help them uh, get to a place where they are comfortable with the choice they've made and that their health is the most important thing they should be thinking about. And even, um, even when it comes to uh, partner relationships, um, you know, I, I've got 30 years experience seeing women and, fit and interacting with their families and their partners. And at the end of the day, 99% uh, are just happy to have their partner alive and well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that we probably, uh, maybe if anything, have gone a little bit um, uh, in favor of reconstruction in our consultations, only because I think in years gone by, patients weren't offered reconstruction, even though it was available. And we had in Ontario, what to lend like seven to nine percent of patients getting reconstruction yeah. because the surgeons didn't offer and patients didn't feel entitled. Uh, and they didn't dare to ask. They didn't know mm -hmm. if it was covered. And so they didn't say anything and it wasn't articulated to them. And I felt like that's genuinely unfair. And I think now we're probably in an effort to tell patients that it's covered, it's available, it's there if you want it. 
hopefully we aren't making them feel that they need to make that choice. I think mm-hmm. we're really most of the breast surgeons are in a genuinely needing to spend a good amount of time talking to the patient in earnest about this is what's available. This is not going to cost you. This is what it's going to look like. You can have it. You cannot have it. The cancer part, we can't control this part. We can control and we want to be supportive of whatever the decision is. So I'm hoping that there isn't that sort of societal pressure. Um, maybe one yeah. last question uh, to Lynn as we wrap up um, from uh, someone wishing to remain flat bilaterally, having trouble communicating that wish with the team and any tips. So maybe how do, how do we help patients articulate um, were there maybe again, maybe against some of these pressures trying to navigate their uh, mm-hmm. wishes? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the great things about, um, uh, you know, a lot of breast cancer programs now is, is how, um, uh, we really try to provide a lot of patient education right from the very beginning um, in a multi-layered way. So, you know, you do obviously meet your surgeon and, and other healthcare practitioners. Um, we have nurse navigators and, um, uh, and, and social work often, you know, co- coordinating care with patients in a, in a really comprehensive way. So I think what you want to do is make sure that you have um, you know, the discussions with your surgeon um, and, uh, and the whole team that's sort of uh, taking part in your care. And um, uh, because we're there to help. I mean, this is, this is the, the primary uh, goal is, is, to, is to get a patient back on their way to, to good health. So, um, so we, you know, we definitely want to know what the concerns are, what the questions are. I think asking questions like, well, um, what, what would I expect that the scar will look like? What will I expect, um, you know, to see right after surgery? Uh, and, you know, if, if it's something that um, in terms of, uh, you know, specific information, um, could you lead, you know, show me kind of uh, where I can get information with, with respect to pictures? Uh, are there patients that I could talk to? You know, I think these are very good questions to really open up that conversation and make sure that everybody's on the same page about what expectations are. Um, you know, they do say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think that's so true. You know, as much as we can explain something verbally, you know, for hours, there's there's nothing that replaces just that, that visual kind of uh, information giving. So I think that really is key. And just um, asking those questions, because it's, it's really important in your treatment journey to kind of, um, you know, make sure that, uh, that all of those questions are answered. Yes, I agree totally. And there are often patient advocates that are there for you in the clinic. And so if it's a mm-hmm. challenging conversation for you to bring up, or you're not wanting to kind of go against the grain or, or, or change the way we're heading, mm-hmm. um, then engage your clinic nurse or your nurse navigator, your nurse practitioner, um, those are often great patient advocates. So you know what, I actually really am happy to stay flat. Maybe you can help me um, with that conversation. And that can just help support that decision making because everybody uh, wholly uh, wants um, the choice that's right for you. And at the end of the day, you're the only one that really knows that. Yeah. And and never feel worried about asking those questions or, yeah. or, or, or thinking that they're too minimal. There's no yeah. question that's too minimal. You need the answers to these questions and, and we want to provide them obviously. It and doesn't hurt anybody's you know, feelings to change yeah. the plan or to absolutely. say no thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and again, it may not happen on your first visit. There's a ton of information that's kind of going through that first discussion. So um, don't, don't be afraid to say, well, could we have a follow-up conversation? You know, now we're doing virtual care so much now, it's not hard for us to call you or have a video consultation or follow up and these kind of things, um, uh, even in the midst of a pandemic. So, yeah. <laughs> or to say, I've taken this off the table, but I'm debating still between this and this. That, that's okay. It helps to refine. It's like a dance, I think, between yeah. the patient and the surgeon. You're kind of whittling your way through, figuring out where, where yeah. you're going to end up landing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very individual patient thing. And so many options, right? Because um, it, that's what makes breast cancer surgery unique in that way, right? And, uh, and so we have the opportunity to really tailor for each individual patient what their priorities are, what their treatment um, goals should be, and, and uh, you know, how we can achieve those things. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's important to ha- to seek the information because the information is the power, and it's a t- at a time when you are feeling quite powerless. 
So it, yeah, it really yeah. is important to take the time and get look to the resources and get the information you need. Yes, absolutely. And the Canadian Cancer, Canadian, Canadian Cancer Society and some of the other resources that um, Heidi's highlighted are excellent starting points. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I want to thank my panel, Tulin Sill and Heidi Scott uh, for coming. And thank you for uh, all of you for attending and for asking uh, great questions. And we wish you all well. Mm -hmm. Thank and you, everybody. Muriel. Thank you, Tulin. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you, Heidi. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you. All of you too. Bye. Bye. Bye.